those lights are brighter than you'd expect. Hi. Yeah, so my name's Paul Lemon. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about me, in fact, possibly a bit too much about me, and if you get bored, just yawn or something, and I'll take the cue. Mostly, I'm going to talk about the Winter Olympics and Grace Note, so just give you a bit of background about Grace Note. It's probably not a company name you guys have heard of, but it's probably a data set that you've interacted with at some point. In fact, if I was in the US, I would estimate everybody had seen Grace Note data. I reckon it's probably about 95% of you, but you won't know. So mostly we're a business to business company. So that means we supply metadata to other businesses. And it's got three kind of central cores, which is music, video, and sports. So the music is the core and the origin of the business. In fact, the first time I came across Grace Note data was like back in 1998. And this is probably like archaeology for you guys. I inserted my CD. Does everyone know what a CD is? <laughs> these little silver discs, and that was how you played music on your big beige computer um, that sat and occupied most of your desk space. And I put it in a computer, and it, it, it instantly found the track names. So before this, you'd have to type them in, you'd download your CD, put in all the track names. This was like magic. I was connected to the internet on my 33K modem, and it's, it had the track names. And this was Grace Note data, and I didn't know until I interviewed with the founder a few, quite a few years later, like 20. Um, but they founded CDDB, which was an open source database that had all the track names, all the artist names, and it recognized the fingerprint of the video. It was awesome. Um, Grace Note's still going. It's part of Nielsen. And that, music's, that music data is still a really strong part of the business. And if you've interacted with any online music stores, you've seen Grace Note data. They expanded and grew and added video. So it's a similar story for video, except this is mostly around program schedules for cable channels. And that's why I say if you're in the US, you will have seen Grace Note data because every cable channel schedule uses Grace Note data. And you might think a TV company just has their own schedule. There's a tremendous amount of work around putting that together, um, annotating it with the actors' names, the directors' names, tying together all the series that there are so you can do series, link and skip backwards and forwards. On top of that, in the last four years, they added uh, sports. And that's the division I work with. So the, the original driver for that was, of course, if you've got a TV schedule, and particularly if it's connected TV, it's not streaming, the most compelling reason people are watching that is live sports. So they really wanted to enrich that data. So to do that, they bought two companies, one over here in Canada, Halifax, Nova Scotia. They were called Sports Direct. And over here, a company not far from here in Newheim called Infostrada. Both have been around about 20 years, and this little dot is where I'm from originally, Leeds. So I like to think when they were looking for someone, they traced the dots and thought, ah, there's, some, there's someone who's kind of connected between the two. I moved over here about a year ago, and it's, it's been a fantastic experience. I love living in Utrecht in the Netherlands. It's just awesome. So uh, why did they buy two companies? So what's pretty compelling about Grace Note Sports is it's a truly global um, sporting data set. And the, you know, the obvious examples are football and football. <laughs> it is, yeah. I have to, I'm used to calling this soccer now, and I, I, I might say that, and that's just disgusting because that's football, right? But we're a North American company, basically, so this is football, that's soccer. And I think we always think it's an interesting example how basically the same sport, the kind of proto-rugby type rugby football, split across the ocean and turned into these two different sports. A lot of my job is about bringing these two teams together. They essentially created the same product for different data sets, and it's kind of the same, it's kind of football, but it's kind of different as well. And a lot of what we're doing is bringing that together. I'm, I'm not going to focus on the kind of BAU sports, the on-running season. I'm going to talk about the Winter Olympics more. Okay, so about me. Like, I'm really, really old, and I feel really old in this room today. I, I, I don't know if I can say I was 47, 47, 47 on Saturday. Uh, it's fantastic to be here with all these bright young minds learning about technology, but I've been around a while and I've been working on the internet since about 1998. Um, I thought it might be interesting for you guys starting off in your career to hear about, um, well, my haphazard career, I think is the best way to do it. You know, I didn't start with a, a plan, it sort of ended, and it's a little bit like throwing darts on a dartboard. This is a diagram you might have seen around on the internet. It's kind of about finding a happy place, because if you can find a job that you love, that you can make some money on, and that you can do, that's a pretty sweet spot. So kind of where are my interests? You know, the proto Paul Lemon back in 1992. What, what was I into? That's 
Thwaite. Oh, Everton. This is Everton winning the FA Cup in 1985. I grew up in Merseyside, um, which is near Liverpool. My first day at school, my dad hadn't taught me about football at all. And all these kids said, hey, then, who do you support? What's your team? I was like, well, what teams are there? <laughs> and there was the red team and there was the blue team. And it was just a simple choice. I like blue. And I chose Everton. And it was pretty disastrous, really, because Liverpool were absolutely dominant for about 20 years. And I am still incredibly bitter about it. But we won a trophy. Awesome times. I placed it here, actually, before I skip on, on the passion thing, because I am useless at sports. So I, I love it. But... I'm absolutely useless. This is a, a picture of my favourite ever gig, and I'm going to ask, has anyone heard of Iggy Pop? <laughs> hey, oh, good. My wife said no one's going to have heard of him. You're showing yourself as even older. Wow, I, I was at this. It was fantastic. Iggy Pop was a, a, a first started in the 60s with the Stooges, and this was in the 2000s, and it was awesome seeing him on stage. But live music and music is a real passion for me, and I kind of put it... Creeping into the capability, I play really, really bad guitar, but I'm also into music tech and I know about sound engineering. Okay, next. Making stuff. Is every, who likes making things? Good, because that's what this business is all about. My dad was one of these guys who had a workshop, and loads of tools and stuff. I was useless. It is nowhere near the capability place, but I wanted to take things apart and make them, and you know, like I was a hindrance more than a help to him. Um, but there's money there, right? So you can make a living out of this, making things. So that's a useful thing. Moving on. Right, this is a proper history lesson. This was my first computer, the BBC microcomputer. And it played some wonderful, look at this high-res 3D graphics. Blew me away. Actually, I wasn't too bad at this. It hit the sweet spot. I didn't know there was money to be made then. I didn't know there were jobs, but there were. We're all very lucky to be involved in technology. It's a great opportunity. I was quite good at it, actually. I didn't program Elite or any games like that, but I was all right. And it kind of tied in with that making things. It was a passion. Okay. Oh, and then last, travel. So, like, who wouldn't include travel as an interest? And I'm capable. I can get on a plane. I can get off a plane. You know, you don't have to worry about that. But it's an interesting thing. So that was kind of proto-lemon mapped out. It was quite an interesting little experience for me to do this. So how was that for my career? So, after I graduated, this is me outside a venue in 1997 on tour with a couple of geezers, some great geezers. So, my first experience of work was I toured as a live sound engineer. I worked in a local venue. I got to work with some incredibly unfamous bands, but we toured. It most definitely fitted into this region. I've done it as a circle. Sometimes my sound engineering was pretty... Sometimes it was okay. It never made me any money. <laughs> And I realized I need to retarget. Actually, my first ever visit to Utrecht was the old Tivoli, not the fantastic, magnificent new Tivoli, but the old one. And I never thought I'd be back here, and here I am quite a few years later living here. Um, right, so I thought better get programming again. I ended up working for about 10 years at an agency in Leeds called Made by Pi. So the job of an agency is to take commissions from other companies and make stuff, make websites mostly. And I started as a junior engineer. I made cups of tea and anything. And then as the company grew, I got really lucky and grew with it, and I spent about 10 years there and became technical director. So sometimes we didn't make money because, you know, like it was difficult to price it. Sometimes we did. Sometimes it was exciting stuff. We made games for Disney, made uh, sports websites for UEFA, and sometimes we made banking stuff. And that was okay, but, you know, didn't quite fit in there. So that's what that circle is. Right, then I moved over to BBC Sport and became a technical product owner. So a lot of that was at Made by Pi. We waited for people to ask us to make stuff. When we made it, you knew it wasn't finished. You knew it could be improved. You know, you saw user research. I wanted to do all of that. I wanted to work on a product and build it. And I was super lucky to get to work at the BBC. Um, I was the product owner for the team who ingested sports data from suppliers and then published out on the website. And so you can probably see where I'm going with that. Yeah, it was all right. I made a living. I loved working at the BBC, even back to the BBC microcomputer. It was a great thing to work there. I was pretty good. Actually, I learned more there than I learned in any other job. It was a fantastic organization, and it taught me an awful lot. Next, I jumped over to Sky. And that, the good thing about that is here I've been working as a product owner. So do you know what the product owner role is? Yeah, there's a few nods. 
as a noise. But that's the, the person who decides what's important to make. And I, I had opinions. I've got opinions about everything, and I'm quite happy to talk. But mostly I wanted to do the software engineering. I wanted to be on my BBC Micro. I joined Sky and built up a team of 70 engineers from scratch. Incredible experience of team building. Um, but I was working with software engineers again, and that was fantastic. Work-wise, it kind of hovered around here. I mostly looked after billing and help journeys. It was great to make stuff that helped people understand what was going on. Not hugely inspiring, but a, a wonderful company to work with and a wonderful work experience. So last but least, and I think I've hit my sweet spot now, so I'll tell you more about Gracenote, but I, I'm really fortunate to have found a place where it kind of combines all three. I lead an engineering team who do some really interesting tech. It's something I'm really passionate about, both the data angle and getting to see the live sports. And I think, I don't know, I, may, <laughs> I don't know where I place myself on there. I'm going to put myself dead center now. OK, so I, I just thought, in terms of where you are in your careers, thinking about what it is you're interested in and how your career will evolve, it, it might be useful for you to hear about that. I hope it was. Right, on to the Olympics. Okay, so Gracenote bought Infostrada. So whenever I talk about Gracenote, I, I include the entire history of Infostrada, and Infostrada has the Olympics baked into it. They've done 17 years of Olympics, um, and that's taking real-time results from a feed called the ODF, Olympic Data Feed. So there are literally people inside the venues, at all the Olympic venues, summer and winter, watching what's going on, using input devices to put out a feed. It's a single feed that's shared by all broadcasters, but Grace Note Stroke Infostrada have a huge expertise in it. It's one of the most complicated, if not the most complicated, sporting feed. They've also got a full database of Olympic history back to 1892. And that's just like basically their passion, right? When they started, like, wouldn't it be cool if we had this? Not, you know, not, not what will we do with it? Um, but it's really super useful because we can do real-time results and we can tie it together with what's happened in the past. And we use that to power things like a virtual medal table, a prediction of who's going to win um, the medals race table by country based on historical performance and the ongoing database of live athletics. Um, this is about Summer Games. So this is just really about the complexity of the Olympics. So Summer Games has 302. Winter has about 220. Winter Olympics is the little brother of the, the, the um, Summer Games. There is no other more complex sporting event in terms of the data. There are a multitude of sports, all of which have different rules, different scoring, and different formats. And they change up to the minute people walk up to start. One, you know, like you've got teams like the USA, like Netherlands, superbly organized. And then you've got some countries that aren't, and they just don't show up, or an athlete's not there. So it is a truly live data feed. It's not, it's not like soccer, stroke football, where you pretty much can predict what's going to happen. It's super organized, starts time. Olympics is not like that. And it's the second biggest sporting event in terms of audience, but in terms of complexity, it's the most complex, and it's a huge challenge. This is kind of how I try to describe how reliable and how difficult this is. If you're doing... Oh, Wind a bit. If you're doing soccer, it starts off with some friendlies. There's a match on a Saturday. It builds up. There's some midweek matches. The, the um, competition lasts a long time. It's reliable. Olympics starts and ends in about two weeks. And you, you, if as a team, you go from zero to 100 kilometers per hour. There are rehearsals, but nothing prepares you for it. So you've got to be super resilient and prepared and knowledgeable. Olympics coding is a team sport. So I guess from... I was thinking for this room, there's probably going to be a mix of people. So, of course, there are software engineers building software. But you've got project managers. You've got people testing it. You've got product owners. You've got people designing the UX. I think one of the things that, not one of the things, the most important thing when I'm hiring and I'm looking to meet people is their capability to work in a team. It's awesome if you're an amazing software engineer. If you're a great project planner, awesome. But if you can't work in a team, and you can't scale to deal with these big projects. That's where I you know, look for another candidate. So just for you guys in your education, every opportunity you get to work and learn as a team, please, please take it. It's incredibly important. And there's some pictures of us doing some informal axe throwing and the team's getting a gold medal at the end of the Olympics. OK, so what are our products? This is a dull slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> we made a website that showed all of the Olympic results. We also have small containers called widgets, and I'll show you. And this was embedded on our clients' websites. 
So they don't know who Grace Note is, but a lot of people who went to websites to see Olympic data actually saw a, a, a little portion of, of Grace Note product. We have a direct API, so some customers just take the data on a feed and use that to build their websites, to build a multitude of things. Um, what was really interesting this time is since Grace Note video became involved, we started to focus on that link up between video and sports. And these are our baby steps, but we did some stuff with overlaying graphics onto TV and integrating journeys to and from video streaming. So, you know, most people now are actually watching sports over the internet. OTT, as it's called, over the top. So the more we can integrate our data feed with that, the better. And we, we made some baby steps on that. OK, so these are the widgets. And these are the, the two key widget journeys um, for Olympics data. What's on? What's happening now? When can I see things? And then the medals table. This is actually the Sochi medals table. I haven't updated my slides post-Olympics. Um, so these are widgets. This little square is an embeddable chunk people can put in their website. Um, and what I describe this as is static data. It's not a great word, actually, but it's what we've called it, because it does change. The schedule updates, sports are live or they're not live, the medals table obviously changes. But the main thing about this is it's relatively slow changing data. If you get that within 30 seconds, that's cool. The audience got what they wanted. So, some more examples of the widgets. So these are exactly the same widgets. These are the widgets on the NOS website. Did anyone see these widgets or use the NOS website at the Olympics? Yes, good. Right, so you've seen the same thing, different languages, styled so it fits in. I've, I've, we've cut them out, but you can see here it's embedded in, and they can put some ads on, and they can make some money, and that's part of the business case for putting sports data on. Okay, and then here, same widget, but in a mobile view. Around about 60 to 70% of all sports viewing is on a mobile phone, either as a companion piece when you're watching the TV or when you're out and about and you want to catch up with it. So they're all built responsively. Flip through a few more examples. German, yes, Yahoo. I'll cut a load of these out. Okay, and then live data. So this is a hockey match, Sweden, Switzerland. It's probably Sochi example data. But this is live updating, right? So these points in each period have to update within seconds. The total score, you've got all the stats, and they need to live update. They can't lag behind. So this is what I would call live or fast data. And here's a variation for curling. And you start to see the crazy detail they go into on the ODF. And there are people who love this, right? This really matters, this stuff. Someone nodding there. I think it matters to you. <laughs> Sorry. OK, and then again, this updates live, right? So this all comes from the ODF feed, but we collect similar data for other sports, just the Olympics we take from the ODF. OK, and then here's just like the absolute crazy level of detail. This is the song that's playing during this figure skating. I love this. <laughs> OK. Right, so scale. It is, you know, summer is the second biggest, but there are a lot of eyes on this. So just to give you some context about the growth for Grace Note and to sort of lead into the tech bit I'm going to talk about, Summer Olympics 26 was Grace Note's biggest ever, so the easy number to count because we can't tell how many people saw the data from our API, but the widget, 180 million widget views. We were pretty pleased with that. That, that made us think we should go more. In Pyeongchang, so the Winter Olympics is about half the size, half the audience. We exceeded that with 206 million widget views. So that's, that's good news in itself, right? But that didn't include any of our lead clients. So our lead clients, I can't share that data, but conservatively, at least double this. So we work with some huge US broadcasters, and we've we got some really big numbers. And there's, there's some more stuff there. But the point is, is you've really got to be able to deal with scale. You've got to be super reliable. If this goes down, or you have an error on 1% of users' pages, that's two, 2 million people. 2 million people got a problem. I didn't sleep, if I'm perfectly honest, during the Olympics. <laughs> okay. So a bit about the tech. I'm going to kind of skim over this a little bit and tell you why, rather than going into detail. If people want to know more, give me a shout afterwards. So I won't, I won't talk through all this. This is our classic data path. This is the core of the Infrastrata system that's powered all of their sports. We take data from the ODF over here. So they're in the venue, and this little gap here is however many thousands of miles you are from the venue. We take that in, we map it against all the historical data. So ODF has its own ID space, so we need to know 
this athlete as to the ODF is this athlete who's competed 20 times. This is Lindsay Vaughan, this is Lindsay Vaughan. So that's what that's all about. We store that. We've also got a manual backup. This feed is not reliable. This internet connection is not reliable. We can drop back to that at any point. There were a couple of times we needed that. It goes through a publication process that does some translations. Um, we cache that for speed, and then it's available on an API. We serve it to widgets and clients. It takes about 10 to 30 seconds. And that's just the nature of something that's getting on for about 10 years old. Super reliable, incredible data depth, but it takes about 10 to 30 seconds. So I've got a video, and I'll go over here. I don't know if this is going to work properly without me being here. Bear with me. So this was the big use case from our major US client who I can't name. <laughs> all right. So all right. This is their OTT and live TV stream. This, this video here comes directly from the Olympics. This is all burnt in at the Olympics. No one has any control on it. This is some ads where they make money and stuff, and that's their own live feed. This is powered by GraceNote data. So this doesn't join together into one video stream until it gets to the headquarters of our major US clients, who I can't name. There is no synchronization. The data kind of came from the same place, but no one synchronized that. And our major US client, that I can't name, have been wanting to do this for a long time, of having a data stream burnt into their video at the same time as that that's synchronized. So, this isn't probably as exciting for you as it is for me, but it was super exciting. I remember watching this. So here we've got F. Brigoni, Brigoni. We've got an athlete coming down on the women's super G. And so the so that data there, that's, that, that's like she's going she's gonna to pass a gate in a minute. Okay, and then look. So, whoa. <laughs> That's the exciting thing, right? See, I got really excited there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can't split the difference. <laughs> I tried to find it. That was exactly at the same time. That was bloody awesome. That was a huge achievement between us. So the whole point is, if it takes 10 to 30 seconds, there's no way you can synchronize that. You've got no control of the data. So, back to you a minute. Right. Talking to yourselves. So we built this. It's simple, isn't it? Really nice. Beautiful. OK, so I'm not going to go into detail. We've got the ODF. We've got our customers and users. And this is what we call the static data going through the classic architecture. It does everything. It's got everything. But it takes 10 to 30 seconds. Here, there's just tons and tons of work encapsulated in our fast path. So we hosted that on Amazon in the EU and also in the US. So the stability was covered for the fact we actually hosted this in two distinct internet regions. If the entire internet went down in the US, we were covered by Europe and vice versa. So it's a duplicate here. Um, the main job of this was to get the data through super fast, and we had to rethink our technology completely. What we had was running at its peak, super reliable, but we need to think again. So this is our tech stack. So the key Part of this is Kafka. Kafka is a data streaming platform, um, easy to scale. And by scale, it means you can use it. It can deal with many, many applications at the same time. And it's super fast. It's incredibly low latency. So you can use that as a kind of separation layer between the elements of your architecture to feed data through. A um, few more bits. We wrote everything in Scala, which is a Java, a JVM language, um, particularly suited to data streaming and manipulation of data. Um, in terms of hosting, we used Docker images, sat on top of Kubernetes. Kubernetes allowed us to configure the restart and scaling of our applications and deployment. Um, we used a NoSQL database, Mongo. Um, and that was all sat on top of Instana. Crucial, and I'm not showing anywhere near the number of monitoring tools, is you need to know what's going on in real time. And Instana was one of the things we used for that. OK. So we called it Bolt, <laughs> reason inclusion. So we went from 10 to 30 seconds to 200 milliseconds. And that was the big achievement for us. And I say, I'm not going into technical depth here about that. I'd, I'd be happy to. But that took us about 18 months to do. 
We've now got a platform with Bolt and with some of the work that we've been doing in Canada that we can um, apply this to other sports and we can look forward to a Summer Olympics. It was just a, a massive achievement for us. And it was, as I say, I go back to data overlay. Maybe we should have done that last. It was an incredible thrill watching that happen during the games when you know all of the, the governance that's gone on behind that. Okay, so that was it for me. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.